automotive legend Mickey Thompson's property in the wealthy gated community of Bradbury, California could accurately be described as a dream home. It was 3,558 square feet with a concrete wall around the perimeter and gates at each entrance. He shared it with his wife, Trudy, who worked alongside her legendary husband on many of his business ventures. Mickey and Trudy's home sat atop a hill, emblazoned on the side of a six-door, 13-car garage where the letters MT. Inside were many of the cars Mickey had made history with in both drag racing and IndyCar. There was also a shop, office space, and a vault filled with film footage. Mickey hoped to one day make a movie about his career. Little did he know that any film about his life would have to include a tragic end. Among Mickey's treasures were his land speed racer Assault, Mickey's favorite car, which he'd driven to break dozens of Nazi speed records. In a trailer sat the storied Challenger and its four supercharged Pontiac engines. On every available shelf were dozens of trophies, some decades old at this point, a visible legacy of achievement. A few years earlier, a wildfire had ripped through the property, destroying many of Mickey's other cars. Mickey himself had defended his garage with a two-inch hose, dousing the walls of the garage and keeping the flames at bay while many other houses in the neighborhood burned. On a spring morning in 1988, a different sort of elemental danger stirred on the grounds of the Thompson estate. At dawn on March 16th, neighbors heard screams and shouts coming from the typically peaceful Thompson property. A car slammed into a wall. Gunshots rang out, followed by a silence more terrible than the screams. Mickey and Trudy Thompson had been shot dead in their driveway. Their dream home was now the stage for a waking nightmare. Why were they killed? Who was responsible? What mysteries still persist about that terrible morning? Today on Pass Gas, it's the murder of Mickey and Trudy Thompson. Pass Gas Podcast. It's about cars, it's not about forts. Chills. Chills. Whoa. I don't know where to go from here. Uh, yeah, very... <laughs> Uh, somber and frightening tone. Welcome back to Pass Gas, everybody. Uh, today is part two of our series on Mickey Thompson. Last week, we talked about the legendary racer's life and all of his accomplishments, what he did for the world of motorsport, and how he helped bring racing into the popular mainstream. Uh, and today, unfortunately, we are diving into the murder of both he and his wife. And, uh... As we're going to see, it's not a very straightforward story. There's a very clear suspect, but the police had a very hard time pursuing justice in this case. A lot of twists and turns. Um, yeah. Yeah, la last week was super fun. This week, off to a grim start. Mm -hmm. So thanks for that, Nolan. And it's not even close enough to Halloween to be so spooky. So... I blame you, Nolan. Yeah, I'll, I blame Nolan, too. <laughs> I'll take it. Today is October 5th, if you're listening to this on the audio format. So we are in the spooky month of October. I'm going to talk like this the whole time, I think. <laughs> yeah, that'd be respectful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think I'm going to talk like this the whole time. You're going to be a suspect, dude. Okay, you get <laughs> right on into it, Nolan. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like that you're looking directly into the camera. Yeah. <laughs> Joe! <laughs> what are you doing back here? You know not to come back here, Joe. <laughs> you know not to come back here, Joe. <laughs> 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 All right. Anyway, I'm joined by my two hosts. As always, we got one James Pumphrey uh, <laughs> covering his eyes. Uh, Mo Power, baby. And as always, Joe Weber. What's up, Wink Wink Nation? Text your loved ones. Tell them that you're safe. <laughs> <laughs> Joe is just, we're, we record these like a few weeks in advance. And I think Joe is just assuming that there's another disaster somewhere uh and he's letting you know joe you said fired up so much that california oregon oh and washington are on fire do you think that this is your fault i didn't even put that together but uh yeah i mean the viral power of my catchphrases spread like wildfire i mean speaking of the fire 
I'm looking out my window for the first time in probably two weeks, and it's finally a blue sky, uh, which I, I did not realize how much I valued over the the uh, the smoke. Hellscape smoke. Yeah. 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 yeah, for the first time in a while, my house doesn't smell like burning wood. Yeah. I it's... skated for two hours yesterday with Alex and Max and Kanan, and got back and just was like 15 minutes just like ugh, ugh, like hawking up <laughs> it's gross it's not a good idea to go exercise outside right now yeah definitely don't do that unless you have a unless you're nija huston and have an indoor complex where you can nija huston <laughs> houston Ni my bad it's spelled huston <laughs> he's got some cool cars he uh he did a sweet 50-50 grind on Alex Choi's oh, yeah. Lamborghini, which I thought was pretty freaking sick. Uh, anyway, unless you're Nija and have an indoor complex where you can safely skate, stay indoors, away from the smoke, lest you be hacking up loogies like Joe. Let's get into it. Six weeks before the events of March 16th, Mickey's son, Danny, got a weird phone call from his dad. Mickey told him to be very careful and to make sure his wife Valeria and newborn son Travis were safe. He wouldn't provide any more details. Fast forward to March and once again Danny's phone rang. This time it wasn't his dad, it was one of his employees. He wouldn't say anything other than that Danny needed to drive to his dad's house in Bradbury ASAP. Danny got in his car and started driving. He turned on the radio. There is a voice announcing some sort of celebrity murder. Typical talk radio fodder. But then, Danny heard the word Bradbury, and his blood went cold. As he pulled up to his dad's house at 53 Woodland Drive, he saw that the driveway was blocked off with police tape. News helicopters circled overhead. Danny got out of his car and looked up the hill towards the house. His father's body, surrounded by cops, was lying prone on the concrete, bloody and still. As more family and friends learned of Mickey and Trudy's murder, one name was on everyone's lips. Mike Goodwin. Like, I get that that's a tough phone call to make, but I feel like the employee kind of copped out a little bit. Where it's like, yeah. hey, you should uh, just go to your dad's house. Like, why? What's up? Is something wrong? Ah, I just think maybe you should just go check out your dad's house. Yeah, what's, what's oh. worse, the anticipation of hearing bad news or the anticipation of seeing your dad's dead body? Well, I think like paired with the radio and then pulling up and seeing police all around, like having to piece it together to me yeah. seems pretty rough. That's what I think. That's I agree. Like the anticipation is much worse. I I need to know. Like if <laughs> it goes wrong, just tell me. I don't I don't care. Right. Like then you know and you can start dealing with it versus like well, is I mean, it looks like it is but it, like, hopefully it's not Yeah. like you still have that. Hopefully it's not, hopefully it's not, hopefully it's not. And then you kind of have to like live the news a number of times that way. Yeah. And also like, if you don't know what's going on, like you could think that your parents are still alive. And so you're right. maybe you're rushing and speeding on the highway, which is also like not great as well. Like if you know that there's like nothing that y you can do, you're not going to put yourself in danger getting there. <sighs> Yeah, I don't know if I I can see how an employee would be like I can't be the one to tell him. Uh but I Yeah, I mean I'm sure that's what it was. It's yeah. like I don't know if it's my place, but it sort of is if you're the one calling him. I yeah. would I would rather I would like like a preface of like uh you need to go to your parents' house like uh there's been a murder. There's something Yeah, how would you even say that? Like I think you just say it. I think like you're just like, hey, your mom and dad have been murdered. I mean, it's not good news. <sighs> I don't know. Very tough situation. Before we dive into the details of March 16th, let's introduce Mike Goodwin, a name you probably haven't heard before. By the early 80s, Mickey and his wife Trudy were managing Mickey Thompson Entertainment Group, or MTEG, a motorsports stadium tour that was one of the earliest touring off-road racing series in the United States. Um, if you, if you watch stadium trucks today, MTEG is basically the progenitor of that. Damn. Yeah. Mickey Thompson basically invented stadium trucks, which are one of the, it's one of the coolest forms of racing to watch. 
Yeah, I love it. It's like li- like just like trucks just going off ramps. <laughs> Are they like? Do they kind of look like Baja trucks? Yeah, they kind of do. Um, the ones today, they're they mostly do on like ro- or street courses, um, where they have the ramps and stuff like that. I mean, you'll see them if you go to like the Long Beach Grand Prix. They're racing on the same course with ramps set up. But these guys. Uh, MTEG, the stadium tour was like, they would go to places like the LA Coliseum or these other big stadiums, set up courses that were almost like dirt, dirt bike or supercross courses rather, which we'll also mention later in the episode, uh, and race trucks inside of a, a professional a pro sports stadium. So pretty amazing. Although Mickey already had a successful performance parts company, he loved throwing himself into projects, tinkering with, uh, other projects like hydro barriers, which are now ubiquitous traffic barriers that can be transported and filled with water to be used on racetracks and highways. Hey, you know, I'm thinking about putting water in a barrel. What do you think about that? <laughs> It'll never work. I don't know. I've been tinkering. A uh, barrel holds a lot of water. They'll never catch on. People don't want water in their barrels. They want their barrels full of cement or nothing at all. (laughs) However, Mickey's true passion as he entered his golden years was still MTEG, which only had a small staff apart from Mickey and Trudy. By 1984, both Mickey and his wife were experiencing health issues. Mickey famously subsisted on a terrible junk food diet that was now taking a toll and they finally decided to take off some of the load by partnering MTEG's events with a motorsports promoter known as Mike Goodwin. Goodwin had made his name as a rock and roll promoter in the wild atmosphere of the 1970s SoCal. His crazy lifestyle lived up to his job title. According to one person who knew him, Mike would quote, He would have ridden a snake if he could hold on to it. His life was all about money, partying, sex, and power in no particular order. Cool, dude. (laughs) (laughs) Can I bum a cigarette? (laughs) Can I borrow five bucks? I gotta go pick up my daughter. I just need some gas. If you give me ten, I can get her some chicken nuggets. Was that uh, Cece from Twisted Sister? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I used to be. I used to run this street, man. Back in the day, we used to go for all the way from the whiskey to the cha cha lounge, man. Everybody knew us. All the bouncers knew us. This was back when you could do a great solo with only three notes. <laughs> <laughs> After organizing concerts for big names for like uh, Ray Charles to Janis Joplin, Goodwin expanded into motocross racing in 1972, holding an event billed as the, quote, Super Bowl of Motocross in the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum. The event, which included racers jumping through the famed arches of the Coliseum, was a massive success. The Super Bowl reference even inspired the adoption of the term Supercross, to oh. describe these hypercharged off-road motorcycle events. So obviously, uh, uh, you know, he's got experience with that. It seems like a pretty experienced partner for Mickey when it comes to stadium events. Yeah. I always like when um, when companies can't say the Super Bowl, you know, like... Oh, yeah, the big game. Oh, you what are you doing for the big game? Oh, I love the big game. <laughs> oh, you need to stock up for the big game. On the big game day that comes after Saturday, you're going to want all the food yeah. you need. They can't even say Sunday. <laughs> Mickey, although now a rich man, was a working class hero, the Bruce Springsteen of racing. Goodwin was his opposite, a flashy playboy who frequently dressed in a knee-length fur coat. Yep. Yep. He liked to show off his money and flaunt his international hunting trips, including one where he killed a Kodiak bear. Ugh. He lived in a three-story ocean view house in Laguna Beach, dude, with an indoor waterfall. He fully embraced the glamour that came with promoting massive stadium events, and his charm clearly impressed Thompson. In April of 84, the two men signed a trial contract to work together. Right from the beginning, the collaboration did not go smoothly. The first Thompson Goodwin race was held in Indianapolis and lost money, as did their second event held at the Pontiac Silverdome in Michigan. Their contract was a 30 70 split for both profits and expenses, with Goodwin owning the larger share. What? Thompson's got the name recognition. Yeah, but it sounds like 
This guy was doing more work, probably. I mean, this guy's the promoter, you know? Like, he's got the, the juice in that realm, yeah. you know? He's got the touch. Uh, he's got the power. He's got the touch. He's got the power. He's got the touch. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> he's got the power. <sighs> After the two events had run at a loss, Mickey's office noticed a discrepancy in the accounting. After further investigation, they discovered that Goodwin hadn't put up for his share of the losses. In his defense, he did have an indoor waterfall to pay for. It's not really a great defense. (laughs) At that point, according to those who were working with him, Mickey was willing to take the hit and walk away. He and Goodwin agreed to stop working together, and according to Mickey, Goodwin also agreed to return to the motorcycle exclusive events he'd previously been organizing, with Mickey continuing to do off-road shows with buggies and trucks. Thus... Avoiding direct competition. This was where Goodwin didn't stay true to his word. At his next event in Anaheim, he included buggy races. You don't put Mm. buggies in your races, dude. You didn't even do buggies. That's not what you do. You do motorcycles. I do the buggies and trucks. Needless to say, Mickey was pissed. That's why you always get an agreement in writing. Handshakes mean nothing. Handshakes mean nothing. There's no such thing as a gentleman. Now, Mickey might have been a blue-collar dude, but he still had white-collar lawyers. He sued Goodwin in 1985, winning a settlement for three-quarters of a million dollars. Okay. Also known as $750,000 hairs. For people who don't use fractions, i.e. our European fans. I'll do the freaking maths for you. That's 750 big ones. Now, that led Goodwin to filing for bankruptcy and countersuing Mickey. For the next three years, the two men would be embroiled in a legal battle. What was supposed to be a deal to take the load off Mickey was turning into a major headache. But in Mickey's eyes, Goodwin had taken it too far. He was determined to teach him a lesson and take the fur coat right off his back. Yeah, snatch that waterfall. (laughs) I want your waterfall. No, Mickey, anything. I want the waterfall. Goodwin resorted to financial (laughs) trickery to avoid financial losses. The courts ordered that he sell his company to pay expenses, but Goodwin maneuvered the proceedings so that his wife, Diane, won the auction for ownership of the company. She took over and immediately hired Mike to run the business, paying him 240 grand a year. That's 85 money, dude. Yeah, dude, that's That's big. A lot of money in 1985. (laughs) This infuriated Mickey, who had also put in a bid in the auction. The bad blood was evident to everyone involved. The presiding judge recalled that the interesting aspect of the case was the animosity between the two principals of that company, Michael Goodwin and Mikey Mickey Thompson. (laughs) Mickey Thompson had gotten $500,000 judgment against Goodwin, and he was going to collect come hell or high water. I remember it being very... A very difficult situation to handle because emotions uh, were running so high. Why is this courtroom so dang hot? Why we all got to wear suits? Well, I, I got to wear a suit and a dang robe on top. Of I it. have a suit underneath my robe. <laughs> Doesn't What's make the, a lick of sense. I don't wear nothing under my robe on hot days. <laughs> Is that a gavel in your robe? Are you just happy to see me? <laughs> <laughs> in 1987, things only got worse for Goodwin. Anaheim Stadium asked for bids on the rights to host off-road events at the arena. Although the stadium had previously allowed multiple groups to host dirt events, they wanted to streamline things and deal with one promoter. This incensed Goodwin. He had held events at the Anaheim Stadium for 13 years, He'd sold out 10 events in a row, and now he's being asked to put in a low bid for a sport he had a major role in popularizing. I have a question. Yeah. What do you guys know anything about, like, how events are organized? Like, what does a promoter do? Do you know? Uh, promote. I mean, it's well, he's like, like a producer. Yeah. So he's the guy who hires all the people. So he's pulling strings okay. behind the scenes, but he's also, you know, printing. A million flyers. He's he's mm-hmm. hiring people to go on the radio and promote it and stuff like that. Yeah, but he also hires like the announcer, and he also uh, or or she they also organize like all the um like the athletes to show up and the teams to show up. Okay, so they're yeah they're basically producers then. They're yeah, making, they're like hiring the people to make the production happen. Yeah, mm-hmm. and then like when you hear about like Evil Knievel or like this guy Mike Goodwin. 
or like Mickey Thompson, like if they can put mm. a spin on it and make it popular, make people care about it, then they're good at it. Cool. Now, if he was mad before the bids, he must have been furious when he lost the contract to a guy named Mickey Thompson, who had partnered with some Texas-based backers to put in a bid, edging Goodwin out. A new article from the time put it in blunt terms. The Anaheim Stadium decision is the one that may finally bury Goodwin. Not since the infamous USAC car war over control of IndyCar racing. Has there been a motorsport-related feud as bitter and prolonged as that between stadium promoters Mickey Thompson and Mike Goodwin? I mean, all he had to do is not put buggies in his show, right? Yeah, all he had to do was, mm, yeah, kind of. I think Mickey would have not gone after him. But that's another episode that we should do is the cart. Uh, oh, absolutely. Yeah. That's a we'll crazy do that. story. We'll definitely do that. Can you can you explain it to me in 30 seconds? The the guy who ran Indy, like the Indianapolis 500, like the track, Yeah. Uh, just was like, hey, I'm going to run the sport now. And they were like, the other people were like, nah. And he was like, yeah, I'm going to start my own sport. And wow. then he just did. That's a serious BDM right there. Big dong move. Mickey didn't look the part of a skilled negotiator. When executives he was dealing with showed up to his facility, he was often wearing jeans and a stained shirt over his pot belly, working under the car. But maybe that's what made him so effective. Nobody would guess that he was a successful businessman and a multimillionaire. Meanwhile, Goodwin made every effort to look like a player, but Thompson had outplayed him at every turn. According to multiple people who knew both men, Goodwin was extremely bitter and borderline obsessive. He started to make threats against Thompson and his family to anyone who'd listen. Ted Nugent, yeah, that Ted Nugent, was a buddy of Mickey's and advised Thompson to carry a gun. Ted Nugent told you to carry a gun? That's out of character. <laughs> <laughs> At a party, Goodwin was overheard telling people that he was going to, quote, take out Mickey. But the threats only made Mickey angry. Mickey saw Goodwin as a bully, and he figured that bullies bluster and make empty threats. Still, he took precautions, including buying a gun and varying the route he took home from Anaheim after work. Trudy, for her part, was terrified. According to Mickey's daughter, Lindy, Trudy told her on multiple occasions that she feared for the lives of her family members. Fast forward to the fateful month of March 1988, and Mickey and Mike were still feuding years after their split. On March 2nd, Mickey won another lawsuit against his nemesis. Goodwin had been running TV ads that suggested Mickey's off-road shows were canceled, a transparent attempt to hurt Mickey's business. On March 12th, Mickey and Trudy attended a birthday party for some racing friends. Mickey was having a good time and played down his friend's concern about Goodwin. He had plans with his son Danny to build and run a two-engine land speed racer to try and break the 500 mile per hour mark that he'd fallen short of back in the 60s with a Challenger. On March 14th, just two days before the murder, Goodwin made a settlement offer to Mickey's lawyer, but Mickey had to turn him down. Mickey was confident that he had the upper hand for good. Then on March 16th, Mickey and Trudy woke up before dawn to make the drive to the Mickey Thompson Entertainment Group offices in Anaheim. Two men in hoodies stopped the couple in their driveway. Minutes later, the couple was shot dead. Mickey was 59, and his wife Trudy was 41. The news spread quickly. Lindy Thompson, Mickey's daughter by first wife Judy, was opening up the flower shop she managed in Eugene, Oregon, when her mother called her up and told her that her dad and stepmother had been murdered. As a kid, Lindy had revered her distant father, who didn't think that Lindy, as a young lady, had a place at the racetrack or the auto shop. It was a tough dynamic to deal with, certainly. And Lindy had run away from home at the age of 16, traveling around the West Coast with a group of bikers before getting arrested for transporting weed across the Mexico-United States border. At her court hearing, her dad had shown up in a disguise with a gray wig, glasses, and a cane. He was worried that he'd be recognized by the press and didn't want to lose sponsors. It was a tough relationship that had recently shown signs of thawing out. But no more. Lindy and her kids were traveling back to California to attend the funeral. That's crazy. Yeah. Tough situation to be in, especially when you're on the verge of reconciling. 
Meanwhile, the police were on the hunt for two suspects, described by neighbors who had seen them flee the scene as black males in their 20s wearing dark hooded sweatsuits. Detectives put together the facts of the case, which were admittedly very sparse. The two gunmen had infiltrated Mickey and Trudy's gated community on bicycles and were lurking outside Mickey and Trudy's home at the pre-dawn hour of 6 a.m. on March 16th. The Thompson's plan had been to drive to work in Anaheim separately. Mickey opened the garage door so Trudy could leave the driveway, then headed to his own car. As Trudy backed out of the garage, one of the assailants fired a 9mm bullet at her side window, shattering it and piercing the windshield. What? Trudy panicked and lost control of the van, which slammed backwards into a wall. She jumped out of the car and tried to crawl away from the scene. Forensics reported that her acrylic fingernails had broken off on the concrete driveway. Oof. Mickey heard the commotion and headed back towards the garage. A neighbor heard him scream, don't shoot my wife. His pleas were in vain. Mickey was shot multiple times in the leg and torso. One shooter then dispatched Trudy with a shot. The other gunman did the same to Mickey, shooting him as he lay on the ground. As neighbors hurried to their windows in response to the screaming and gunfire, the two assailants escaped the scene again by bicycle. The brutal method of the killing seemed to indicate it wasn't a robbery. After all, Mickey and Trudy were clearly leaving the house. The plan was theft. They could have waited for the house's occupants to leave. Mickey and Trudy had thousands of dollars worth of cash and jewelry on their person and property, but nothing had been taken apart from their lives. A cop on the case described the murder to the LA Times in no uncertain terms as, quote, an assassination. In addition to the initial suspect description, police were on the lookout for a blonde man in his 30s riding a gray Columbia brand 12 speed bicycle in Irwindale nearly 10 miles away shortly after 7 a.m. on Wednesday. The man had been seen trying to wave down cars, and the police thought he might have been associated with the shooters. Uh, kind of weird stretch to make, in my opinion. Yeah, could you... I mean, this was at 6... The murder was at 6 a.m. This was at 7. You could do 10 miles an hour on a bike, right? Oh, 100%. Yeah, you could do that. I did, I did that for a little bit, riding to the office. Yeah, right, dude. And I was... No, it's very sweaty. <laughs> uh, I had to bring an extra shirt every time. Anyway, the link, the link between the man on the bicycle and the shooters was tenuous, which was proof of how little detectives had to work with. Friends of the Thompsons sprang into action, contributing to a reward fund that quickly grew to $260,000. But despite the financial incentive, it was soon clear that the case was growing cold. Whew. Heavy. Meanwhile, Mickey and Trudy's joint funeral was standing room only. A singer sang We've Only Just Begun by the Carpenters, a song with special significance to Mickey and Trudy. Mickey and Trudy had danced to it at their Las Vegas wedding 17 years prior. Notably in attendance was Mickey's close sister, Colleen, who in keeping with Mickey's signature style of mixing business with family, had frequently handled Mickey's public relations on various projects. Colleen took the meaning of the funeral song to heart. The hunt to find her brother and sister-in-law's killers had only just begun. The ballad became her personal anthem as she became the family point person for all matters relating to the murder. Strangely, Colleen already had personal experience with a murder in the family. Only a few years earlier, her son Scott had been killed in brutal fashion. Scott had allegedly been transporting cocaine from Mexico when his relationship with his criminal associates went sour. Jesus, what, I mean, <laughs> what is up with the kids in this family? He was strangled while aboard a private plane en route to North Dakota when his body was dumped in the Pacific Ocean, never to be found. Jesus Whoa. Christ. I, no, I would not like to be strangled, preferably. That would, uh, that sounds... Wait, uh, we'll that's, you guys, that. check out this, this picture I posted in the podcast channel of uh, Mike Goodwin. Doesn't he look like Jeremy Clarkson? Like an American Jeremy Clarkson? Oh, yeah. Kind of. Yeah, he looks like um, an actor. Like he, yeah. Like, my, like, he would be very easy to cast. Yeah. He looks like... Which which he, probably means that he's a sociopath if he looks yeah. like an actor. <laughs> mm -hmm. Big old thanks to Caliber CBD for sponsoring this episode of Past Gas. 
I use CBD for baseball because I, I get sore a lot and getting old. CBD helps me really like tackle the soreness I get from baseball and stuff like that without making me feel weird and drowsy and stuff. One of the best ways of getting CBD in your system is by ingesting it. And Caliber CBD is one of the best companies that makes oils and powders and food and stuff that you can just put into your food and drink. No weird taste, no oily residue or anything. It's just straight CBD. And every packet of Caliber CBD has about 20 milligrams in there. So that's a good amount. That'll make you not sore. It helps with mental health. That sounded like a question, but I know the answer. You can put it in your coffee, you can put it in a smoothie, put it in your cocktail or mocktail or boktail, protein shakes, cookies. It doesn't change the taste of stuff. Caliper CBD oil is much better than any standard CBD oil. Uh, it's clinically proven to absorb 450% more CBD compared to other tinctures. That's, that's crazy. That's a lot. 450%. I wish I made 450% more money. I wish I was 450% stronger. And Calber CBD gives you all those benefits in just 15 minutes. That's twice as fast as any like normal CBD oil. Caliper CBD comes in affordable 30 and 60 count packs. So you can just get it in bulk. You don't have to worry about buying it all the time. Individual packets give you the benefit of CBD oil wherever you go. And unlike some other products, Caliper CBD is completely THC free, which if you don't know, that's the other part of cannabis. It only gives you the health benefits. None of that other, you know, weird feeling that you might be uncomfortable with. It's all natural, all GMO free ingredients. No fillers, no added chemicals, nothing of that weird stuff. So you might be asking yourself, how do I get my hands on some of this Caliper CBD? Well, you can get 20% off your first order if you use the promo code GAS. That's G-A-S. You try Caliper CBD risk-free for 30 days. If you don't like it, they give you all your money back. That's trycaliper.com slash G-A-S. And don't forget that promo code G-A-S so they know we sent you. 20% off first order. That's great. Thanks, Caliper CBD. Like, I don't want to be insensitive, but like Mickey Thompson's daughter was arrested for smuggling drugs. His nephew was arrested for smuggling drugs. And like, do you guys ever think like we're becoming more and more successful? Like, do you ever just like worry that your kids are going to suck? <laughs> like if you, um, yeah. Like if you reach like a level of like success, like your kids are just going to be... <laughs> I've, I've thought about this a lot. Cause like, I want to be rich. I, yeah. that's a big goal for me, but I don't want to raise a rich kid. Right. Yeah. Like my, my girlfriend is like a very successful business lady and like, I have my own thing going and like, we don't want a rich <laughs> kid. Yeah. That's the worst. I think what you got to do to prevent that is not have a house that echoes inside. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. I think there's a little bit more that goes into it, but <laughs> I know, but that's, that's a big component, at least in my opinion, is that like, you got to have enough. There's something, something about echoey houses. I also, so, so I also think there's like a thing to be said of like, at some point, like, if you decide that you're going to have kids, like that has to be a pretty selfless act. And like, then you're like, okay, now I'm going to like raise my kids. I spent yeah. one year in like a really rich neighborhood in eighth grade, uh, right outside of DC. And like their parents were so like career oriented, like they all worked in DC and like, they were just like never home. And we were just like <laughs> in their huge basements, like their finished basements, which don't get yeah. me started on finished basements because <laughs> everyone does a finished basement. We're like, yeah, I'll just have the boys over and we'll play ski, ski ball. And it'll be like a bar that in the neighborhood, but then it's just where your kid <laughs> It's just, <laughs> oh my God. it's Jesus. only, it oh only God. becomes a place for your. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> Bridget, you need to bleep that. <laughs> don't, they'll assume it's worse. I don't like, <laughs> too specific. You're too specific. Too Dude, specific. All of my friends. And, oh <laughs> and they were like exits to the outside. So we were just like, we would come and go as we please. We'd meet up in the woods, start fires. Wow. Much different uh, high school experience than me. Definitely a lot of like uh, 
salacious things going down there. Yeah, so no basements. That's that's a rule for me. No basements. Yeah, no no echoey houses, no basements. Uh, try to maintain a, a healthy work-life balance and focus on your kids. No one ever dies and, and says, I wish I would have worked more. It's always... I wish I would have spent more time with my kids. Dang, a really somber episode, man. In the aftermath of her son's murder, Colleen and her husband Gary had doggedly tracked down the killers, eventually convincing their son's North Dakota drug connection to wear a wire and secretly record the killers inadvertently confessing to the crime. What was it? Uh, Takashi 69? <laughs> <laughs> nice. Because of Colleen's determination, her son's killers were now behind bars. She was determined to win the same results for her brother. It's crazy that this woman lady, has dude. to do it twice. Yeah. yeah. Like, I got to bring another mur family murderer to justice. In Colleen's own words, no one is trained to be a victim of a crime. But growing up the daughter of a police officer and going through what we went through with our son probably gave us a better handle of what law enforcement could and could not do in solving the case. It wasn't an education we wanted, but we weren't going to dump it. Wow. Colleen's life had changed in many ways since her simple childhood under the hot sun of the San Fernando Valley. By the 80s, Colleen, like Mickey, had left those blue-collar beginnings behind for a life of wealth. She now lived in the gated community of San Juan Capistrano and was deeply enmeshed in the wealthy Orange County social scene. Down, down there near Dana Point, near baby. BB. San Juan Capistrano. The prime suspect for the case quickly became Mike Goodwin. Mickey's lawyer, Phil Bartonetti, was informed that Goodwin had hired an ex-police officer to follow him. He received death threat letters at his residence and even at the golf club where he was a member. Bartonetti was certain that the letters were coming from Goodwin. Colleen was also targeted. She got a call from a blocked number. She was certain it was Goodwin, but couldn't prove it. The voice growled, Hey, mother... <laughs> If you don't back off, you're going to join your brother. Eesh. Colleen was unfazed. She's like, I already solved another murder. F*** you. Yeah, so this ain't my first murder rodeo, you f***. I'm dead inside. Murder rodeo's a good band name. <laughs> yeah. Justice is my only joy, you f <laughs> piece of shit. <laughs> I am a ghost of a shell of a woman. Damn, I thought that was written. That was so well <laughs> said. <laughs> Soon after, Goodwin became an official suspect in the case. At that point, the threats directed at Colleen and Bartonetti suddenly stopped. Weird. Oh. In Bartonetti's opinion, I think he was shocked that he became a suspect almost right away. I think he believed he could shine on the police. And they'd think, well, it can't possibly be this guy. I have a belief that his lawyer told him that if he had any other plans, he better not do anything. <laughs> Spurred on by the Thompson family, the L.A. County Sheriff's Office interviewed over 700 people over the rest of 1988 in relation to the murders. They heard all about the threats Goodwin had made towards the Thompsons, but without direct evidence, it was only hearsay. Same with the motive. It was perfectly clear that Goodwin had reasons to want Mickey dead, but motive wasn't proof. Meanwhile, it was announced that the Mickey Thompson Entertainment Group would continue to operate. The company released a statement that Mickey had already developed a five-year plan, assembled the staff he wanted, and set the course for the company's future. In fact, he and Trudy had planned to start taking it easy right after his birthday on December 7th. The company would continue for a few years before going bankrupt in the 90s. It was a tragic end to the legacy Thompson had been building for himself. The family started to divide up Mickey's belongings. Like many car guys, he was a uh, bit of a hoarder, Nolan. His son Danny said <laughs> that he filled 53 dumpsters with trash and rented a 5,000-foot wow. storage warehouse to keep his father's belongings and cars that were worth preserving. Dude... I, I, I relate to this so much. I think we talked about it last week. I'm so afraid of having to do this for all the stuff my dad has, dude. Meanwhile, Colleen turned to the media to try to give the case more bandwidth. Among many other media and news profiles, the case was featured on the hit TV show Unsolved Mysteries in 1989, which is back on Netflix now, leading to 150 people calling in with tips. Still, no progress was made in the case. 
For his part, Goodwin made several highly suspicious moves just before Thompson's death. In January of that year, he purchased $275,000 in gold coins despite claiming bankruptcy. He'd also wired $400,000 to offshore banks in the Caribbean. Soon after the murders of Mickey and Trudy, Goodwin and his wife left town. For four years, he avoided Southern California, sailing around the Caribbean on a 57-foot yacht, going spearfishing and skiing in Aspen. When Goodwin finally returned to California in 1992, which, side note, why would he do that? He was arrested (laughs) on financial fraud charges unrelated to the murders. Meanwhile, karma seemed to be at work. As Colleen's fortunes headed in the opposite direction of Goodwin's. She was elected as the mayor of San Juan Capistrano in 1993. What a fun job. Just like, I'm the mayor of my rich neighborhood. (laughs) Isn't there like, like... Isn't that neighborhood known for swallows? No, that's that's Nolan's mom's neighborhood. Oh my god. <laughs> <sighs> Nolan, oh my god. I, she's the mayor. I, <laughs> uh Colleen marshaled her connections to encourage the police to continue investigating the murder, which was now firmly situated in the frozen section of the cold case files. Goodwin had been convinced that she, <laughs> Goodwin had been convicted and was being sentenced for fraud, but that wasn't enough for Colleen. You know, obviously, because he murdered her brother. For her to win justice for her brother, she wanted Goodwin to be charged with murder. Finally, in 1997, there was a breakthrough in the case. At Colleen's urging, new homicide detectives have been assigned to the case, among them Midwesterner named Mark Lillianfield. Lillianfield spent months following up on the many tips that had come in over the years, at times traveling the country to follow up on leads. Finally, his break came when he took another look at the bullets that had killed Mickey and Trudy, comparing them to the guns that had been in Goodwin's possession at the time of the murders. He determined that the crime scene bullets could be a match for a 9mm Smith & Wesson Model 469 owned by Goodwin. It was an encouraging lead, but... It still wasn't enough evidence to charge Goodwin. I mean, I'm like happy, you know, I'm like good for Colleen, you know, like justice. Great. But this is just like, so like the American justice system. It's like, it takes a rich white lady to get any attempt at. Yeah. Like, and even like a rich white lady has to be like the mayor of San Luis Capistrano. (laughs) Well, I mean, as we'll see, there there wasn't. As we'll see, though, it's because of a lack of evidence. It's really hard you, to to build a case. Circumstantial isn't always enough. But also, obviously. after like after watching, I'll be gone in the dark. It's so broken. Like the justice system is unbelievably broken. Precincts don't even talk to other precincts. Cops used to barely even talk to other detectives. There's no communication. I think there's just like a oh I can't I can't figure this out. Like there's no point. Like there's no yeah I, <laughs> I don't know I, I don't I I don't disagree that there that the system needs a lot of overhauling. I'm just thinking in in this case particularly, there is a reason why it was it went cold so quickly. You know, because the killers did a good job. I suppose so. They didn't leave a lot of clues. In 2001, again with help from Colleen, the Thompson case was featured on America's Most Wanted. Uh, Great, great program. More than a decade after the murder, it caused a sensation and a revival of public interest in the case, receiving multiple follow-ups on the show. In the words of one of the show's producers, quote, I can't think of any other crime that got this much attention. With the Thompson murders, we were doing mentions even when there were no developments and even when the main story wasn't about the Thompsons. In an ironic twist of fate, even after his death, Mickey Thompson's name remained a powerful draw for media attention. The most wanted coverage led to an avalanche of fresh tips, almost all of them dead ends though. That bad luck would change some weeks after the first episode aired when Lilienfeld received a tip that led him to Ronald Stevens, one of Mickey Thompson's former neighbors in Bradbury. Stephen told Lilienfeld that a week before the murders, he had seen two white men in a rusty Malibu station wagon hanging around near Thompson's house. One of them had a pair of binoculars. Lilienfeld presented Stevens with a photo array and asked him if any of the men looked familiar. Stevens 
hesitantly picked out Goodwin's photo. Lilienfeld continued to gather evidence, and in 2001, 13 years after the murder, he traveled to Dana Point and arrested Goodwin, who by then had served his time in prison and was out on probation for his financial charges. Goodwin was a long way from his days of spearfishing and living in a mansion with a built-in waterfall. His residence was now a trailer shared with his elderly father. Lilienfeld put Goodwin in a police lineup. Both Mickey's neighbor and his wife then picked him out as the man who had been sitting in the station wagon. That was good enough for Lilienfeld. Goodwin was charged with murder. When Colleen got word of the news, she and her friends celebrated by gathering for a champagne toast. It was Goodwin himself reviewing boxes of discovery evidence in his jail cell who discovered a critical error in Lilienfeld's case. The gun that had been used to murder Mickey Thompson had six so-called lands and grooves the etching in the barrel of the gun that makes bullets rotate. However, Goodwin, Smith & Wesson only had five of these grooves. It was impossible that his gun was the murder weapon. Lilienfeld was confronted with the evidence and confessed to what he called an honest mistake. At this point, the evidence linking Goodwin to the murders was tenuous at best. The gun evidence had been thrown out. The eyewitness putting Goodwin in the station wagon also didn't quite add up. The car had been parked almost a mile away from the Thompson's house with a hill blocking any potential surveillance. The best case prosecutors had was Goodwin's motive and the threats he had made about Mickey in the years leading up to the murders. Despite this, Goodwin was charged with capital murder and was ineligible for bail. He spent five years in prison as his case moved towards trial, with the court date being continuously delayed by over 60 different court proceedings. The one bright spot for Goodwin was that he had been transferred to L.A. County Jail and would be tried there, not in Orange County, where Colleen's political power had the potential to influence the case in her favor. Without physical evidence, the prosecution instead tried to focus on Goodwin's reputation and actions before the murder. They had over 40 witnesses testify, eight of whom said they had been personally threatened by Goodwin. In response, Goodwin's defense lawyer, public defender Elena Saris, argued there was no actual evidence linking Goodwin to the murders. It's crazy. This dude was like a majillionaire, and now he's, he has a public defender. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what happened to all his gold coins? Got, oh, yeah, like... They're still out there. James's oh. treasure hunter character can probably go find We got to go find Goodwin's gold. <laughs> <laughs> In her closing statement, the lawyer said of her client, call him a jerk, call him an egomaniac, call him a braggart, but prove what you're alleging rather than arouse passion and prejudice against this man. The prosecutors have no killers, no plan, no meeting, no weapon, no phone calls, no payout, no nothing. The only physical evidence from the scene is DNA that does not match Michael Goodwin. The jury deliberated for six days, and on January 4th, 2007, Judge Terry Schwartz read the verdict to a packed courtroom, vibrating with silent tension. Mike Goodwin, guilty on two charges of first-degree murder. The sentence, two consecutive life terms with no possibility of parole. Goodwin bowed his head and avoided eye contact. I'm just wow. amazed that they were able to do that with no evidence at all. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know how to feel. Yeah, I don't it's know how like, to feel about this. No physical I'm, evidence. I'm fairly sure he did this, but it also proves how broken the system is. Yeah. Like, that someone can get convicted without any evidence. Yeah, because the dude's sister is powerful. And the guy was famous. I mean, I'm like 85% sure that he orchestrated it. But like, what is the point? I mean, I don't want to get like too soapboxy or anything like that. But like, what's the point of having like a fair and balanced trial if stuff like this can happen? You know, that's where I'm at, too, because like, yeah. I'm pretty sure the guy did it. He's obviously a piece. of <laughs> I want him to rot in hell, but there's no evidence. So like what? Yeah. Why do we even have a system? This is why, like, every couple of years, someone gets out of jail after spending 20 years in jail because they, you know, prove that they weren't the murderer. Like, that shouldn't happen ever. Right. Yeah. Because he was a jerk. Because he got a bunch of people being like, yeah, he's a f <laughs> man. He probably killed him. Yeah. At his sentencing hearing, Goodwin refused to take blame for the murder. I have condolences for Mrs. Campbell, but I can't apologize because I'm not guilty, he said. Colleen gave an interview to Court TV. I believe Mickey and Trudy were helping with this case. I knew someone that evil would not walk. 
The foreman of the jury stated that people think that every single fact has to be proven and DNA'd and stamped, that it has to be an open and shut, gun in hand, blood on the t-shirt kind of case, which it obviously wasn't. There were so many reasons for Goodwin to be guilty that it would be a logical, reasonable deduction to say, who else? You know what I mean? Who else? That's not how it's supposed to work. Beyond, That's not how like, it works. Literally, it's beyond a reasonable doubt. Not yeah. This person just fucking described a reasonable doubt. If you're if you're ever making a leap of judgment, yeah, that means that you're doing it wrong. Yeah. This is not right. This is not how it's supposed to go. Like again, I'm pretty sure this guy did it, and I, I'm very, I'm sad that Mickey Thompson got murdered. But this is not how you make someone stay in jail for two lifetimes. Yeah, it's a very confusing feeling right now. Very conflicting. Yeah, for sure. Well, of course, it was also far from closure for the Thompson family as well. Throughout the trial, a glaring fact remained. The actual killers had never been caught. And for the 19 years since the murders, there hadn't even been a named suspect linked to the crime scene. Mike Goodwin remains in jail. He continues to maintain his innocence and offer counter theories for the murders. Among them, according to an LA Weekly interview, he has named, quote, one, uh, the Saudis to whom Thompson's Tire Company suppos supposedly sold defective tires, two, members of the Vagos Motorcycle Gang, which I think we mentioned in our Hell's Angels series, against which Thompson once testified in Scott Campbell's murder trial, uh, three, drug lords for whom Thompson supposedly transported product during off-road races in Mexico. All of these are kind of racist. <laughs> Yeah, all the theories are intensely conspiratorial, but then again, so was Goodwin's own conviction. If I was, okay, if I was in prison and I thought I had a theory, mm -hmm. I would probably focus on just one theory mm -hmm. rather than a scattershot that uh, has a, let's say, wide spectrum of... Um, Brown people involved. Yeah, I probably wouldn't do that. Yeah. Anyway, in 2011, motocross historian Tom White paid Goodwin a visit at the High Desert State Prison in Susanville, California. In prison, according to White, Goodwin shared an 8x10 cell with a fellow prisoner. Goodwin had been earning money by doing legal work for other inmates. He was missing a front tooth from a scrap with a fellow prisoner and also walked with a cane. In 2015, a state appellate court upheld Goodwin's sentence, they ruled that the circumstantial evidence in the case was, quote, overwhelming. Goodwin is now in his mid-70s and remains in jail and maintains his innocence. What's up, guys? I just want to talk to you about our sponsor this week, as evidenced by my hat, as always. It's Valvoline. I don't know if you guys can see. This is for our video viewers. Uh, the hat's getting even dirtier every weekend, as promised. Uh, I was crawling around underneath my Imperial last weekend at James's house. If you've listened to past gas, you know that we love our Valvoline here on this show. Uh, and that's because they were the first patented motor oil. They've been around the longest. They are the original motor oil. Um, since their founding over 150 years ago, back in 1866, mind you, Valvoline and their scientists have been innovating, creating, and reinventing formulas such as the first high mileage oil, the first racing oil, and the first synthetic blend oil. Their advanced full synthetic is proven to maximize engine life with 40% better wear protection than industry standards. That's no BS. It better protects against the four major causes of engine breakdown, those being wear, friction, heat, and deposits. It's got advanced protection in stop and go driving. The advanced full synthetic has 10 times better protection against heat and 25% better deposit protection than industry standards. This advanced full synthetic is no joke, guys. The full synthetic high mileage, the oil I'll be putting in my car this weekend, is proven to maximize engine life after 75,000 miles. My car is at 100, almost 152,000 miles, so you know that I'm going to be doing that. It's got 50% better wear protection than industry standards, 10 times better protection against heat, 25% better deposit protection than industry standards. And guys, that full synthetic high mileage oil is the first high mileage motor oil, making it pretty special, if you ask me. 
Valvoline is the only motor oil company with a dedicated engine lab. They're able to run specialized engine tests right in their own facility. Very cool. This allows their scientists more freedom and flexibility as they have the results right at their fingertips. It's called being agile, guys. When you're a big company and you can move like that, you're agile. All Valvoline oils exceed industry standards to provide the ultimate protection for every engine on the road, including yours. But not just yours, guys. If you buy some Valvoline, you'll not only be joining me and the rest of the donut crew, but you're gonna be in some very good company like our buddy Chris Forsberg racing that NOS Energy Formula Drift car. And also you got the Hendrix Motorsports team over in NASCAR with drivers like Jimmy Johnson, Ray Everham, former crew chief for the number 24, and now he, he races his own cars in multiple series. Good for him. And you got Brandon Shepard over there in the World of Outlaws late model. There's been a lot of historic Valvoline drivers that you can join, like Mark Martin, Mario Andretti, and our boy, Jeff Gordon. So uh, yeah, I wanna thank Valvoline for sponsoring Pass Gas. They've been a longtime sponsor of the show and I'm so happy to work with them. Put some Valvoline in your car today. Meanwhile, in 2019, last year, the LA Times reported a bizarre occurrence with Mark Lilienfeld, the cop who had led the charge on arresting Goodwin. He was caught posing as a jail deputy and bringing contraband in for an inmate. Lilienfeld claimed it was a coffee and an egg McMuffin, but jail officials were so alarmed that they banned Lilienfeld from future access to the jail. That's super shady. Yeah, disguising yourself as a, a, a jail deputy? Yeah, disguising yourself as anything is pretty friggin' shady. <laughs> like, my definition. That's, that's sus. That's sus. <laughs> that's sus, dude. Say. No cap, that's sus. As the kids used to say. No cap. <laughs> no cap. No cap, dude, that's sus AF. Definitely not lit. Dude, low uh, key, <laughs> not gonna lie, on a level. No cap, that's sus. Yeah. Listen, I don't want to get ratioed, but no cap, that's sus. <laughs> this questionable behavior, along with Lillian Fell's occasionally shoddy police work, seemed to suggest some level of doubt in the case against Goodwin, if not his actual guilt. To this day, the two gunmen who murdered Mickey and Trudy Thompson on March 16th, 1988, remain at large. Without their arrest, it's hard to say that justice has been done for Mickey, Trudy, and everyone they left behind. Mike Goodwin has now lived decades behind bars. Although he maintains his innocence, it's clear that at the very least, he wished Mickey and Trudy Thompson dead. And when you wish someone dead and they get murdered, people understandably treat you with great suspicion. That's how that works. If there's any lesson to be learned from this dark chapter in automotive history, it's that hatred and violence only lead to more hatred and violence. So let's honor Mickey and Trudy Thompson's legacy by treating each other with love and looking out for one another. Hell yeah. <sighs> yeah, nice way to wrap episode. it up, but I do not feel good about this. <laughs> no, like, not like at Mickey all. Mickey Thompson was such a good, like, cool guy. Some of like the details towards the end, like, obviously doesn't deserve to get murdered, but like 0% blaming the victim, like, did not deserve to get murdered, but like, I just feel weird. I just like don't know. It's a very I don't know yeah. How to feel. I, I, I yeah. think it, I think that's the only way to feel. It's like there's so many, it's it, so many loose ends in this case, and that's why it's kind of. I mean, that's why we're talking about it in the first place. Is that I don't even know how to say this. Like one of the saddest moments of this whole thing was like where they arrested Mike Goodwin at a trailer that he shared with his dad. Like this is like, but that was after that was after he came back. Oh, that was after jail, I guess. Yeah. But like right before that, he was on a a sixty foot yacht in the Caribbean. So I don't feel too bad for him. Yeah, I mean that guy was probably a piece of, <laughs> but like, yeah, it's 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 you want to have a a very clear villain, which you do have in Mike Goodwin. But at the same time, you also have sympathy for him because there is no evidence. Uh, besides the circumstantial and uh, the, the all the character witnesses in the trial, but there's no physical evidence linking him to the case. Yeah, I think he probably. Yeah, I mean that's uh, was, the thing, but that's what like the jury said too. They're like, yeah, yeah, I mean he probably did it. I don't think I, I'll say that I don't think two consecutive life sentences are uh, with no evidence. Yeah, and no yeah. chance of parole. Like, yeah, I, think, I think like the sentencing 
too is like just like a sign of like oh he's got some influential friends in like around yeah. you know like well that's also I, that's also a factor like the case had yeah the case had been in the mainstream for like 10 years 20 over, years at longer this point. than that almost 20 it had been like one of the great unsolved mysteries of pop culture it was on unsolved mysteries so, twice it was on tv two times yeah i mean america's most wanted had an ongoing series with it like that's i think why the jury decided to convict is like oh shit, we have the chance to like close this case we can do this yeah so but so it's this, just it feels hollow it feels hollow without that evidence yeah it needs hard evidence like the, yeah like you, this thing was part of pop culture like this is a big pop culture story for 20 years 20 years ago i was like a child living with my parents you know mm -hmm. what i mean like like it was like a part of and like people's whole lives if you go online uh i mean there's entire websites dedicated to mike goodwin's innocence and they're straight up about it too they're like yeah we know we know he was a, a jerk and that he did make threats but the evidence doesn't point towards him yeah. you know i want to so you mentioned being petty about like the legal stuff i don't think it's petty to hold someone up in court that screwed you over it's not it's reactionary for sure, but I don't. I wouldn't consider it petty to like hold some up, up, hold someone in court. Yeah, I mean, I just think like the like pairing with like a larger company to buy the dude's thing. That's like, like that's like a shot on your head. You know what I mean? That's like that's like when when uh Michael Jackson bought all of McCartney's like songs. Yeah, <laughs> like while he was next to him at the auction, like that's petty. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, Mickey Thompson, as we discovered in the last episode, I think Mickey Thompson was just an old school, best American guy. And if that's the way you're going to treat him in business, he's going to come after you. That was the logical conclusion of that. Don't know why Mike Goodwin decided to be a snake like that, but that's just what happened. He would have you know? rode a snake yeah. if he could have held on to it. Don't, don't write a check your butt can't cash, huh? Okay. Anyway, thank you so much for listening to this episode of Past Gas. Um, somber episode, very much so, but I think we learned some stuff along the way. Uh, if you haven't yet, please check out our main channel, Donut Media. I know there's a few of you out there that listen to podcasts and don't watch our stuff. You should check it out. I think you'd like it. Uh, follow my co-hosts on all social media. You got Joe Weber, uh, at Joe G. Weber. Text your loved ones. Yeah, text your loved ones. And James Pumphrey, at James Pumphrey. And Follow me at Nolan J. Sykes. Herspers, Buff Horses, Mo Powell Baby, Fired Up Wink Wink Nation, Be Kind, I Love You. See you next time. <laughs>